it's it's always it's always a little nerve wracking or makes you a little nervous when you get up here. But usually, pastor's not here, so it's not so bad. I don't have to worry about if I mess up too much. By the time he's heard the tape, the damage has been done. The Word of God, and this was actually one of the, I, I enjoyed kind of putting this together. It was uh, some interesting facts I've, I found out or kind of looked up. Jotted down a lot, of, a lot of things after the fact, so I've got a lot of handwritten stuff. When you think about the Bible, I want you to think about something. It's withstood the test of time. Of course, we know that. Like no other book ever written. It's been on the best-selling list for I don't know how long. But one thing I didn't know is that, that Guinness, the Guinness Book of World Records has it as the all-time best-selling book with over 5 billion copies sold. So that's, that's pretty impressive. All right, so it's the best-selling book. It's, it's had over 5 billion copies sold. As of September 2016, it's been translated into 636 languages. 3,223 languages have at least some portion of the Bible translated. It was written over a span of 1,500 years. It has 40 authors. There are 30 in the Old Testament, 10 in the New Testament. And this is just some things I wrote down. It's been God-inspired people like kings, fishermen, tax collectors, physicians, and in the day that we live in, I'll use this term for Paul, activists that were, trans that were transformed into Christians. It's, uh, he used generals, military leaders like Joshua. He used uh, educated, highly educated people not so educated people, all this vast majority of, of different people to author his holy word. He used all, all kinds of different people. And why did he do that? Because his word was going to be for all kinds of different people, not just for the educated, not just for the wealthy, not just for the poor, for everyone. It was going to be for everyone. So he used all walks of life to author his word, to actually to just pin the the word that he authored. So he used all those kinds of different people. So we're going to look at, I want to look at kind of two broad topics this afternoon, and then we'll, we'll kind of shorten, kind of break those down. I want to start with this. If we're, gonna, if, if we're Christians, okay, if, if we profess to be Christians, if we're saved, born again, blood-bought, all of those terms we use, Christians, we have to come to terms with one thing. That the Word of God, the Bible, is infallible. It, it, it's true from beginning to end. It's, it's inerrant. It's inspired by God. That's the one thing that we have to come to terms with to live our life, is that the Bible is inerrant. It doesn't have error. It doesn't, it's not fallible. It's, it's perfect. It's the perfect Word of a holy God. So... As a Christian, we, t we have to know that before we know anything else. Because I, I was telling Pastor Mike one day that I have, I've had people ask me things about certain topics. And, and they've asked, like, what, so what do, you, what do you think, you know, about some of the things going on in the world and different things? And I've had them ask me these questions, not, not advice, just what, what's your opinion on it? What do, you, what do you think? I always try to explain or start with this. Okay, first of all, for me to tell you what I believe, you're going to have to understand that everything I believe, I'm going to take from the Bible. That's where I'm going to reference from. Today's society wants to argue with you about, just like I said, all these people wrote the Bible. It can't be. It's got to have some error because men wrote it. You know, we hear that sometimes. It has to have error because men, you know, human beings, you know, they translated it. They did all of these things. But what we as Christians have to know that a holy God who is perfect, who, who makes no mistakes, inspired these men to write this word down, to write his word down. And so when, when I tell people that I base what I believe, if you're asking me about a controversial topic, we'll, we'll throw the, the big one out there, homosexuality, if you ask me about that, I'm going to draw from what I, I know the Bible says.
because it doesn't really matter what I say, but I have to know what the Bible says. And I'll, I will say this, when I was young, a young Christian, and Brother Dub was the pastor, and I was newly saved, and I would come to him and I would want advice. He would always say, well, the, here, let's, let's see what the Bible says about that. And I just, wanted, I just wanted him to tell me what I wanted to hear. I didn't want to know what the Bible said about it. I wanted, I wanted him to tell me what I wanted to hear. But he would always do that. He would always say, you know, let's, let's see what the Bible says about that, Keith, or what, whatever, you know. So, so when I talk to people, I always try to tell them, you know, remember, my, what you're going to hear is based on the fact that I'm a Christian and I believe what the Bible says, period. And so as, as a Christian, we have to come to grips with that, that part of it, that the Bible is true. It's not true for what we want it to be and not for what we don't want it to be. It's not true when, it, when, it's, when it's beneficial to us, and, but it's not so we can skip over these parts that, that we, don't, we don't like. It's, it's God's word, period. And I believe that today's society... A part of what their problem is, and it's human nature, is no one wants to be under any kind of authority. So when you, when you have trouble with authority, you have trouble with God's word. Because it, it and we'll get it, I don't want to get too far ahead, but you have to come to grips with that part of it before anything else is that it is true. It is, it is without error. It is without fail. So... What is it? One thing, it's true, okay? It's inerrant and it's infallible. <clears throat> Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and, and will not make, make it good? In other words, if he says it, it it's true. It's the truth. Hebrews 6, 17 and 18 says, thus, determ uh, thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise, the, immutable of his, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. And the Psalm 119, 160 says, The entirety of your word is truth, for every one of your righteous judgments endure forever. And I'm going I'm to use uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16. I'll use it a couple of times. <clears throat> All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, in, and for instruction in righteousness. Okay, so first of all, God's word is infallible. It's inerrant. It's true. Period. Okay, the second thing is God's word is eternal. It's forever. Isaiah 48 says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. So if God tells, you, tells us in his word that by, by, by grace we're saved, we'll just use that one, then forever, after he says it, by grace we are saved. If he says, by my stripes, I'm healed, then once he has spoken it, forever, by his stripes, you're healed. If he says, if any is sick among you, call for the elders, bring them to the front, Anoint them with oil, and the prayer of faith will save the sick. Well, once he has spoken it, it's that way forever. I heard a guy say one time, and I think it was, I don't, I'm not going to call the guy's name because I'll, I'll get it wrong, but he was talking, he was preaching here, and it always stuck with me, and he was talking about, about God speaking things into existence. And he said, we all know that this chair is green. We can look at it. We can look it over Everywhere we want to look, this chair is green. There's no doubt about it. Is this chair green? Right. It's green. No, no doubt it's green. But if God says that chair is blue, that chair is blue. Because the, the moment he says that it's blue, 
It's going to be blue because God cannot lie. If he says, that's why it's so important, and this is off for a little bit, but that's why it's so important to understand it's not what we believe about ourselves, but it's what God says about us. Okay, so if he says this chair is blue and it automatically becomes blue, well, if he says I'm righteous, well, I'm righteous. If he says that I'm healed, I'm healed. If he says that I've been, I've been delivered, I've been redeemed, I've been redeemed. Because once the holy, a holy God says it, it's true. It, it, that's the way it is. Okay, so it's, his, his word is infallible and it's eternal. Now, I'm going to I'm going to come back to the last one. I'm going to use I'm going to I'm going to use it last. I'm going to come back to that. And I want to skip over Could you put that that's the one I want right there. Up there the one you have up there. 2 Timothy 3:16. It says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And 17 says that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I was looking over these, and there was, a, there was something that was kind of a common thread. When I looked up, I, I, I was looking in my, I have a little Easton's Dictionary on my phone. And uh, I was looking at those, and I was looking at the, the definitions of them. And there was, there was uh, other than a couple of them, there was a couple of things in common. And you, I think you'll catch on to it in, in just a minute, but I, and I'll share it with you. But it says that it's, it's given for in, by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for, for the first thing is doctrine. Doctrine is a belief or a set of beliefs held and taught. Okay? You ever heard the, the I can remember people used to say, well, he's, he's brainwashing y'all in that church. Well, yeah, <laughs> pretty much, you know, it's, it's a way, it's a, it's a doc, our doctrine is how we believe. It's a set of beliefs that we hold, that we teach here, that we, that we share. It's, it's the way we believe. So scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So when we, when we get together and we, we look, look at the Bible we have a set of beliefs. We believe that God is creator of all things. Let me look so I don't skip anything. We believe that God is the creator of all things. We believe that Jesus is the son of God, died for our sins, rose again. He was the ultimate sacrifice for our sin. We believe the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. Uh, that when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you receive power, speak in tongues, you become empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. We believe that, <clears throat> that when you're sick, that you can be healed, that, you, you, that God is still, still heals. We believe that when, when you're, when you're uh, emotionally troubled, God is, is still the God that can heal your emotions, that can touch your emotions, your body, your soul, your spirit. We believe all of those things. So the, the scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. It's profitable to teach us how we believe, to show us how we believe. It, it gives us a guideline to come up with the way we believe. It, it's, our, it's our bylaws. It's our, it's our uh, just set of, set of beliefs that we hold to be true. Uh, so when we look at the scripture, th that's where we get uh, the way we believe that, that, you know, you're saved by grace, you, you know, you're baptized by, in water, you know, you're, you're filled with the spirit, your healing is, healing is still for today. All of those things, that's our doctrine. That's our set of beliefs. And it's inspired by the word of God. Okay. Or it's, it's given by the word of God. All right. The next thing is reproof. And I wasn't real sure, 100% sure what that meant. It's kind of an odd definition. It's an expression of blame or disapproval. I, I, I didn't really, really wasn't sure about that, but that, that's, that's what it says, an expression of blame or disapproval. 
I'm going to run through them real quick, and then we'll, I'm going to come back to them. The next one, correction, is to put right, to change something uh, so that it is right or true. Instruction is a tutorage that is education by training, by implication uh, or disciplinary action. To equip is to finish, but or to, to equip fully. But those three things, reproof, correction, instruction, all had kind of a negative connotation to them. It, it was all like they, each one of them had, one of them had the word discipline, one of them had the word blame. I mean, you don't hear that much. See, we had blame, we had discipline, uh, disapproval, and to, to change something that is right, that is to make something right, which means you were wrong to begin with. So the Bible is good. The Word of God is good for doctrine, and it's good for reproof, which means it lets us know beyond a doubt when we're doing something wrong. It lets us know that sometimes we need, do need to be disciplined by God. And what that means is it's not that he's, he's going to browbeat us and he's not going to destroy us or break us down. He's going to chasten us. He's going to correct us when we're wrong. And that's okay because if all of you that are parents, if you don't correct them, they never know when they've done wrong. But if a child is allowed to just keep doing the same thing over and over again, they never know. So God is a good father. And he, when he corrects us, it's for our benefit. Now, a reproof means uh, an expression of blame or disapproval. Now, none of us, I, I don't believe this for a minute, that we want God to, to, be, to dis disapprove of anything we do, uh, of any of our actions, to, to disapprove of who we are, what we are, you know. But there are times that we do mess up. We want to believe that we're, we're perfect or, or whatever, I, I like to believe that I do the right thing all the time, when it, and it's not, not even close to all the time. But God, God cannot watch us do wrong and not disapprove of it. That's just as much as I love my children, I cannot watch them do wrong and not disapprove of their behavior. You know, I never not, don't love them or, or don't approve of them being my children. But I, there are times when I don't approve of their behavior. And God is our Father. And so there are times that he doesn't approve of our behavior, believe it or not. He does not always approve of our behavior. I know we're saved by grace. I know we're under the blood. I know that, that we live under the new covenant. I know all of that. But even with that, there are times that God does not always approve of the way we act. But here's the thing. So there's more to all of that. It doesn't just stop with reproof, okay? The Bible's good for doctrine, reproof, and correction. The thing about God is this. He doesn't just leave you when he is a little disapproved of your behavior, when he disapproves of your behavior, or when he's not happy with the way you're acting, or the way you're treating other people, or this, that, and the other. There is correction. And it's, it's the same thing. It's in his word. All through his word, he teaches us how to treat other people. He teaches us how to, to deal with strife in our life. He teaches us how to, to deal with, with uh, stress, with the way we... I, I go back to what Jesus said. They, they asked him, you know, what, what's the greatest commandment? commandment? And he said, love, your, love, love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. How you are with God and how you are with people. It's the same thing as the Ten Commandments. They're grouped in two different groups. One of them is all about how you deal with how you, your relationship with God. The other one is your relationship with man. So he didn't do away with that. He didn't say, well, the, you know, he, he says, I didn't come to, to uh, do away with the law, but I came to fulfill the law. That's, he didn't say do away. There's another word. But anyway, he came to fulfill that to where we did have a way that when we, we do mess up, and when God's not exactly always, doesn't always approve of our behavior, there's a way to, that we can correct that and fix it. We can repent. We can ask the Lord to forgive us. And as soon as we do, he, he forgives us. Okay? So reproof, correction for instruction. Instruction is the education or training. We're able to look at God's word and draw an education, basically, or to be trained in how to live our lives how to respond to certain events, how, like I said, how to deal with other people, 
And, we, we, and, it's, and it's not just the New Testament, and, it, and it's not just the Old Testament, but the stories in the Old Testament, a lot of those, when you read those stories, they teach you how to deal with situations in your life that come up. And we, you know, Pastor Mike and other, other people do a real good job bringing those things out to where you, can, where you can see that this thing, how it applies to your life, although it happened thousands of years ago when Joshua told the people, we're going to march around Jericho seven times. For seven days or however it goes, we're going to walk around there one time and on the seventh day, we're going we're to shout and the walls are going to come down. Joshua gave instructions and he says this. He says, every day for one day, uh, for six days, we're going to walk around Jericho. We're going to stop. I don't want you to say a word. We're going to go around Jericho. We're going to go around the walls of Jericho. One time, we're going to stop. Don't say a word. We're going to go make camp. We'll get up in the morning. We're going to get up. We're going to walk around the city of Jericho. We're going to march around it. We're going to go around one time. We're going to stop. I don't want you to say a word. We're going to go, we're going to go make camp. We're going to keep doing this. We're going to do this until I tell you to shout. Now, a good preacher will tell you this. This is why he did that. Because when he was one of the 12 spies, they came back from the promised land, and they couldn't keep their mouth shut because they kept talking, well, we can't do this. We can't do this. They're giants. We look like grasshoppers in their sight. They look like giants to us. There's no way we can overcome this. Okay, we can't, we can't take the land other than Joshua and Caleb. So Joshua says, and I, this is probably not really why he told them. I'm sure God had other reasons for this. But he says, we're going to go around the city once. Don't say a word. I don't want to hear it. Because last time, me and Caleb, we knew we could do this. And everybody wanted to talk and, be, and, and say we can't do it. So this time I want you to be quiet. All right, so I said all that to say this. You can look in that story and say, okay, sometimes God just wants you to be quiet. Okay, now I, just, I, I did all that just, just to show you that. There are things in the Old Testament and the New Testament stories that you can look at and you can apply those things to your life. Okay, so it's good for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may com be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And the last one is, is equipped. And that, that just means to finish out or be complete, perfect, okay? So in our walk with God, God wants us to be, he wants us to act correct. He wants us to, all of these things that we just talked about. But the thing, the great thing about God is he equips us to do it. He doesn't tell us to go live a li our life a certain way, but doesn't give us, give us the tools to do it with. Now, most, most of y'all, or some of y'all I know, work with your hands, use tools, and that kind of stuff. And the worst thing in the world is trying to do something when you don't have what you really need to do it with. And I'm a very impatient person when it comes to stuff like that. And I was always one of those guys that I was in a hurry. And if it meant I had to walk to my truck to get the right tool... Well, I'm just going to break something right here trying to use the wrong tool because I was always in a hurry. Now, if I want to frame up this wall, all right, and I've got, I've got my tape, I'm going to lay it out, I'm going to lay out my walls, I'm going to get it ready to frame, I lay my, my plates out, I've got my studs over here, I don't have anything to nail it together with, I don't have a nail gun, you know, the, the old timers, they could do it with a hammer, I can't do that. If I'm going to frame this up and I don't have a nail gun or a hammer, nails, I, that's as far as I got. I can lay my walls out. I can have my studs scattered, scattered along the wall. I can have it ready to frame. But if I don't have the right tool to put that wall together, that wall is just going to, it's just going to lay there in pieces. It's never going to get put up until somebody with the right tool comes along and puts it together. God doesn't leave us alone or without he doesn't leave us unequipped. When, when you're not equipped, you, you can't get it done. And he doesn't leave us like that. He gives us everything we need in his word. He equips us. That's part of the pastor's job is to equip the saints. And he does it through the word of God. So he gives us all the tools that we need to get the job done. Now, now let, me, let me stop there and say this. 
when I say he gives us the tools that we need, he, he lays out in his word, all right? If, if I'm going to be successful in business, it's, it's, in, it's in his word. How, how, to, how to, you know, I'm going to give. I'm going to give, and the Lord's going to give to me. I'm going to tithe. I'm going to bring my offerings. I'm going to do this. If everything you need to know, I'm telling you, it's in there. It, it is in the word of God. If you need to know how to be successful, have a successful marriage, it's in there. If you need to know how to, have, how to be a good mother or father, it's in there. If you need to know how to be a good husband, it's in there. If you need to know how to be a good wife, it's in there. If you need to know how to manage your family, how to act on, on the workplace, how to t treat other people, and I'll tell you another thing that's in there, if you want to know how, how you should are supposed to, the hierarchy of government and, and how you're supposed to treat the leaders, in, whether it's in the church, whether it's in the government, you know, all of that is in there. There used to be a book that I used to have, and I know y'all, probably several of y'all had it, the, the, the blue book called God's Promises. It was a little book. I don't even remember who the author was or whatever, but it's all of you could, what to do when you feel, what to do when you feel, you know, I used to use that thing all the time. <laughs> what to do when you're lonely, what to do when you're sad, what to do when you're financially having trouble financially, what to do when you're, when you're sick, you, you know. And the thing is, everything you need to know is in his word and it's true it's not something that's here today and fades and, and just goes away that you can't count on it is true every bit of it and everything you need to know how to live your life is in his word everything you need to know how to tell somebody else how to live their life now i don't mean that that sounds like you know that sounds bad i'm gonna tell, tell don't tell me how to live my life but when somebody asks you advice on, hey, man, my kids are crazy. So what do I do? Hey, it's, it's in the Bible. Let's, let's, let's see what the Word says. You know, let's, let's look at the Word. That's why it's important to know the Word. And we've become, and I'm guilty. Man, I am guilty. Somebody, who was it, Chris? Said, oh, you brought your Bible today because you're talking about it. Yeah, I, pretty much. <laughs> but uh, we are guilty, guilty, guilty. We've got it on everything. I've got my, the Bible on my phone. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's on there, it's on the computer, and after 20, 30, 25 years or so, you know, I can, I know a lot of scripture. I have no idea where they're at. I'm one of those people, you know, that uh, I know just enough to be dangerous. I know enough to, to misquote it, you know, so, but it, that's why it's important to know the word, because when somebody asks you a question about something, and, and believe it or not, God's placed us here for other people also. He's placed us here on this earth to equip us to help equip someone else. And so when he asks, when someone comes to you, and I'm going to tell you, I'm that guy, sometimes I, boy, I hate to see him coming. I don't want to see him coming. And, and a lot of times it was always because I, I really didn't know if I was going to have the answer. And, it, and I would be uncomfortable about you know, if someone asked me about a certain topic or something like that, and I wouldn't have the answer. And that's why it's important. Read the Bible. I'm telling you, it's interesting. It, it's interesting, man. There's all kinds of things in there. You know, it's, it's being a guy. There's stuff about war. You know, it, it's just anything you can imagine. And God did that because he knew there's a, there's a multifaceted bunch of people out there that needs to read my word. And I've got something in there that's going to appeal to everyone. So, Know what the Bible says, especially know what it says about certain, certain principles in your life because here's, here's the thing. God's word is full of principles. And a principle is this. If I give, I, I'm going to receive. If I do, if I, a principle is like this. If I do this, this is the result. If I sow, I'll reap. If this, and I heard a guy explain it this way. This, these stop signs right here is a principle. That's like a principle. Whether you're, whether you're saved, sinner, outlaw, bandit, good guy, pope, whatever you are, that stop sign is still a stop sign. And it's still, intend, it's still intended for you to stop. And whether you're good, bad, indifferent, if you run that stop sign, you're going to get a ticket if you get caught. Or you're going to at least get pulled over. 
and chastised about it. So the principles of God's word apply to us whether we're living right or whether we're living wrong. You, it's still a principle that you can't get around. So, so don't think because, and, and I know you don't, but don't think, if you, if I, well, if I just don't live right, I don't have to worry about those principles. Well, you still do because it's still a principle. Know what God's word says about different things. Man, I'm, I, I mean, I've been saved 20, 20 something years, and I, I can read stuff, and it's still, that's the thing. His word is alive, it's fresh every time you read it. Now, I saved this for last, and I will promise you, I will finish up on this. My all time favorite scripture is this, and not, not scripture, chapter. It's long. I talked about when I first started, I talked about God's word is infallible. And I've talked about it's forever. And I, the purpose, the way I broke it up was what is God's word and what is the purpose of God's word. The purpose was to equip for reproof, instruction, correction, and all that. Now, I used infallible first and forever or eternal. And I, I told you I'd come back to God's word is powerful. That's the last thing I want, this is the last thing I want to leave you with. God's word is powerful. I'm telling you, it's powerful. It's not just words on a page. It's not just, it's more than we can ever comprehend just how powerful God's word is. I'll start with Genesis. I'm, I'm going to go to my favorite chapter in the Bible here in a minute. But I'll talk about Genesis for just a second. This is how powerful God's word, wa word is. He says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form, and it was a void. Darkness covered the face of the deep, and the Spirit of the Lord hovered over the, the face of the deep. But then he says, and God said. That's how it starts off. That's how all of this started. God said. God said, let there be light. When he said it, it happened. Just like I talked about the cheer being green. If God says it's blue, it's blue. When God speaks, things happen. Stuff happens, okay? God's word is powerful. Not just God's spoken word that he speaks from heaven, but God's word that he inspired to be written in a book is powerful. He said, let there be light, and there was light. And he created with his voice everything until he got to man, and I've talked about that before where he formed man. But all of creation, he spoke into existence just, just by saying it. Boy, don't you wish you could do that? Well, I'd, I'd speak some stuff into existence and out of existence. But anyway, God, with just his voice, spoke and things happened. That's how powerful, that's how powerful God's word is. Now, Job 38, you want to put that up there? And I think, I, I don't remember what version I used, but... Job 38, and we'll start with 4, is my all-time favorite, I guess, chapter in the Bible. Job's the oldest, oldest recorded book in the Bible. It didn't, it didn't happen before Adam, but it's... It, and this, this is Job, and, and I think Pastor Mike might have used this the, the other day, or a couple Sundays ago or something, but Job's complaining a little bit. He's, he's got some troubles. <laughs> Boy, does he. But this is what, and, and God starts talking to him. I can say all this stuff, and it means nothing. Where were you? Where were you when I was cleaning the church? Where were you when I was doing this? Where were you when I did this? But now when God starts speaking, I want you to listen to this. I'm going to read. And just how powerful his word is. It says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know, Job, or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its founda foundations fastened, or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy, or who shut up the sea with doors, when it burst forth and issued from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, when I fixed my limit for it, and set bars and doors. And listen to this. And he's still talking about the sea. He said, when I said, now take, think about how vast, how huge the ocean is. When you look at the globe, all the blue, how vast all of this is, and how 
when hurricanes and when, when storms rage and all of this. And God said, he says, I set the bars and doors. And he's talking about the ocean. He said, when I said, this is as far as you can come. This is as far as you can come. He's talking, he's talking to the ocean. He's not talking to a person who we know is going to, if God says, as far as you go, as far as you go. He's talking to the ocean, the seas. And he said, this as far as you can go. When I said, this far you may come and no further. And here your proud ways must stop. This, the voice of God caused this to happen. He says, have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place? that it might take hold of the end of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it. It takes on form like clay under a seal and stands out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld and the unpraised arm is broken. Have you entered the springs of the sea or have you walked in search of the depths? Have the gates of death been revealed to you or have you seen the doors of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the breadth of the earth Tell me if you know all of this. Where is the way to the dwelling of light and the darkness in its place that you may take to its territory, that you may know the past to its home? Do you know it because you were born then or because the number of your days are great? Have you entered the treasury of snow or have you seen the treasury of hell, which I have reserved for a time of trouble, for the day of the battle of war? By what way is light diffused? Or the east wind scattered over the earth? Who has divided a channel for the overflowing water or a path for the thunderbolt to cause it to rain on a land where there is no one, a wilderness where there is no man, to satisfy the desolate waste and cause, the spring, and cause to spring forth the growth of tender grass? Has the rain a father uh, from whose womb comes the ice and the frost of heaven? Who gives it birth? He's, he's, what he's saying is all of these things, I, I, I did all of that. I did all of that. I, I made frost, hail, rain, all of those things, snow. I did, I did that. Who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice? The waters harden like stone, and the surface of the deep is frozen. Can you bind up the, the uh, cluster or loose the belt of Orion? Can you bring out... Maseroth in its season? Or can you guide the great bear with its cubs? Do you know the ordinances of heaven? Can you set their dominion over the earth? And this is one of my, I love this part right here. Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that an abundance of water may cover you? Can you send out lightning that they may go and say, he says, can you send out lightning and that they'll go and they'll return to you and say, here are we. That's how powerful God's word is. It's powerful. And last little bit, we'll, we'll finish up. Can you send out the lightnings that they may go and say to you, here, here we are. Who has put wisdom in the mind or who has given understanding to the heart? Who can number the clouds of wisdom or who can pour out the bottles of heaven when the dust hardens and clumps and clods cling together? All right, I, I read all of that to say this. God who spoke the heavens into existence. God who tells the sun where to stand who tells the moon what time for it to rise, who, who decides when it's dawn, when it's dusk, who decides that the oceans can come to here and stop. That's as far as they can go. The God that says to the lightning bolts, I'll send you out, but when, and you return and say, here we are. This same God has given us his word in written form to live our life. As almighty and as holy and as powerful and omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, all those big words that he is. As much as he is that, he is our Savior. He is our Lord. He's our friend. He's our instructor. He's our educator. He's the one who corrects us with love. He chastens us with love. He puts us back on the right path when we, when we get off a little bit, when we show out a little bit, when we act up a little bit. He the shepherd's crook, and he puts us back on the right path, and he gives us all of this to live a successful life while we're here, an abundant life, a life that when other people see us, they'll be drawn to it, and to equip us to share and give out the same powerful word in a way that's with love, joy, and all of those things.
So in order to live a, a successful Christian life, it's important that we remember these things. And, I, and this is just kind of my little closing here. That we understand, we must understand that his word is infallible. It's true, period. We have to believe it, that it's powerful, that it's eternal, and it gives us instructions for life in whatever area we need. Amen.